Chairman of the President has expressed his concerns that a non proper organization promotes the compassionate and respectful treatment of domestic fowl. Uh, Greg is the author of several books, including Prison Chickens, Poison the Eggs, and Director of a Chicken Sanctuary. Please welcome her to you can serve the conference. wonderful to be here and to look out on this marvelous crowd of people who care about animals and who want to be able to do something to improve the lives of our fellow creatures, which includes all of us, as well as all of the animals whom we treat, uh, by and large, so very sadly and so badly. But we're here to try to change that. And um, I just want to look at a few things uh, in the past and then look at the future a bit um, in this brief time period that I have. Um, when I got involved in the animal advocacy movement, it was in the early 1980s. And at that time, the advocacy movement was just then starting to pay attention to farm animals. Um, we need to remember that uh, until around 1975, 1976, and then into the 80s, the large organizations that represented animal welfare really stayed away from the issue of farm animals, farmed animals. Um, farmed animals were not part of their advocacy. There were some lone people here and there who tried to speak out about the horrible cruelties endured by animals, particularly in slaughterhouses. And uh, some of you may know that in 1957, a huge battle, uh, well, through the early 1950s into 1957, a huge battle took place um, in the United States to try to get some kind of legislation, uh, humane slaughters legislation for farm animals. Um, there were seven or eight bills that were introduced into the legislature, the U.S. Uh, House of Representatives, in the mid-1970s that sought to extend humane slaughter protective legislation to both livestock and poultry. And one of the things that happened in the, the, the politics and negotiations at that time was that um, poultry were excluded from what became the so-called humane uh, uh, slaughter law. And uh, ever since the mid-1950s, we've been fighting to try to at least bring these birds uh, within the coverage of that law because, as it stands right now, all birds who are considered poultry are totally excluded from any kind of humane slaughter uh, protective legislation. This is not to in any way suggest that there's such a thing as humane slaughter. Uh, it's uh, simply, I, I no way mean to suggest that. I can keep putting quotation marks around humane every time I use the word, so understand that I am putting uh, quotation marks around that word every time I use it. But the fact is, um, it, it's even worse to have no recognition under the law than than to have merely minimal or nominal recognition. Nothing is worse than nothing. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, at, at least in the beginning in the last quarter of the, of the 20th century and up to the present time, the great thing that I have, and, and, and many people in this room I know have, and certainly the people who run organizations such as mine, uh, have enjoyed see happen and have helped to make happen is, uh, is the ascendancy of, of, of farmed animals uh, in the animal advocacy movement. It is, to me, the great thing that has happened to our movement um, since the uh, last quarter of the 20th century. Uh, farm animals going from having no really representation uh, among, in, in the uh, animal welfare uh, efforts, which traditionally focused upon dogs and cats and, and some other animals who didn't really go to the heart, and they all deserve and need every bit of help and protection and advocacy. All animals do need this. But the thing is that, for the most part, the uh, organization leaders themselves were avid animal consumers, and the boards of directors were, and uh, nobody wanted to touch the issue that went to the very core of most people's lives, including that of the animal welfare um, uh, uh, employees and, uh, and, and board members and so on. So we've seen this tremendous, tremendous revolutionary uh, turning of attention to the largest number of abused animals on the planet, who are farmed animals. 
Uh, the largest number of land animals is chickens, as most of you, I think, sure, certainly should leave this conference being aware of, representing 9 out of 10 billion animals being slaughtered each year in this country alone. And 9 out of 10 billion is just a conservative, uh, conservative estimate. It's really many, many, many millions uh, going into uh, larger billions than even that. But these are just the official statistics. Um, uh, the only larger number of animals being consumed by human beings is uh, the creatures of the sea, who are in numbers that, uh, well, they're, not, they're only measured in metric tons by the industry, so uh, the numbers are beyond calculation. Um, as we move forward, we still continue to have our, you know, our disagreements within the movement. Um, even though, the, 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 see, there's a consensus now that there, there didn't used to be, you know, 30 years ago. Most of the organizations who are gathered here at this conference, virtually all, I would hope, or not just virtually, but all, um, are, are vegan organizations. The people who work, uh, uh, who are employed, are staff members of these organizations, who volunteer for these organizations, are vegans. Uh, 30 years ago, you didn't hear about vegans very much, if at all. I, I can't remember when the term was coined, in the 40s or something. Uh, but here we hear vegan all the time. It's now become part of the animal at rights, animal advocacy movement that, you know, you need to be vegan. And, uh, and, and, and being vegan is the best way to, uh, and it's the only ultimate way to solve the problem of farmed animals because the root problem is consumers. Um, so, we're now at this point where uh, we're discussing, we're primarily discussing strategies. What is the best way to get society moving in the direction of, uh, uh, of wanting to be vegan, choosing vegan food products, and electing a vegan lifestyle, which is really a vegan lifestyle uh, it includes but extends beyond diet to uh, want to you know, live as, as compassionately on the earth as possible towards everyone who shares the earth with us. Uh, the concern that I have voiced many times over the years in these uh, wonderful conferences and in other forums has been that I sometimes feel that um, many animal advocates feel very intimidated by the huge, huge burden that confronts us as we try to move mainstream society along with us to get to, to know about what farmed animals go to, through, to, to, want to care about what they go through and to want to change the experience that, that these animals have because of our, our appetites and, and, and our, in many cases, our ignorance about what is happening behind closed doors. Uh, I think it is so important, as important as any other strategy or tactic or whatever you want to call it, that we embody as animal advocates is that we be confident in the, uh, the, the, the value of the work that we are doing for these 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 animals, we are they, we are all they have. But we want those who are all they have to swell in in, in numbers to become every human being on on, on earth on their behalf. Uh, we have to be stand up people for these animals. Uh, as we stand here and we celebrate our victories and and and, and enjoy each other's company and 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 have so many many choices and options. Uh, before us and how we're going to strategize or what we're going to eat tomorrow n night and or what, or who we're going to spend time with the, at any time. We have so many choices and options and meanwhile these animals are just in the most, they're stripped of their dignity, they're stripped of comfort, they're stripped of joy, they're living in the dark. They have nothing. They have nothing. And all because of what, you know, when you really examine it, for food, food that can nourish us in ways that don't have to involve these animals even being born at all. Or if they're going to be born, they should be born living the lives that they were intended to live in nature's uh, original plan. section from the uh, newly um, uh, uh, published and expanded uh, edition of my book, Prison Chickens, Poisoned Eggs, an inside look at the modern poultry industry, which I strongly urge you to go to our website, order this book, read it, and really learn about these birds, what they go through, and what you can do to change the, the way they are treated um, in, this, in this society and by our species. Some people believe, <clears throat> sorry, 
Some people believe we are moving in the direction of quote unquote humane meat and animal friendly agriculture as people become better informed about the realities of industrialized animal production practices. However, a global decline in industrialized, in industrialized animal farming is not going to happen as long as billions of people are consuming animal products. At the very time that experts are calling farmed animal production, quote, one of the top two or three most significant contributors to the most serious environmental problems at every scale from local to, glo to global, unquote, trends indicate that the global production of animal products could very well double by 2050 and that three billion more human beings are going to be on this planet uh, demanding these products unless we really, really make a difference through the power of our advocacy by 2050. Uh, uh, the idea of a past golden age of compassionate animal farming that could somehow be reclaimed and modernized is misplaced. Books such as Keith Thomas's Man and the Natural World, Richard Ryder's Animal Revolution, Charles Patterson's Eternal Treblinka, and Benjamin M. Pierce's 1930s book, uh, Marketing Poultry Products, gives the lie to such wishes. Not only ducks and geese, but chickens and turkeys have traditionally been force-fed, and I mean for centuries, uh, in the procedure known as cramming or noodling in order to increase the size and growth rates of their livers and bodies. To cite one example, I'm up the last sentence right now. Uh, to cite one example, a photograph of turkeys being noodled, that is force-fed, appears in the March issue of the, uh, the March 1930, uh, 1930s issue of National Geographic. This is before factory farming, per se, is supposed to have come into being, um, along with much else that helps to explain why a 16th century British observer wrote of animals raised for food. He said, these animals feed in pain, they lie in pain, they sleep in pain. He was talking about animals, farmed animals, animals raised for human consumption in the 16th century. There never was a golden age for farm animals. The only place to go is ahead. Let's not look back, let's look forward. And let's make as, 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 as much as we can the world that we want to see come into being. It's ahead of us, it's not behind us. Thank you.